Today's first reading comes from 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. <coughs> then the king sat, and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. Our second reading comes from Luke. Luke chapter 22, verses 17 through 20. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This is the cup that is poured out for you. It is the blood of the new covenant. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, in 1775, John Wesley, who started this movement called Methodism, he introduced something called the Covenant Service. And it was supposed to be the most important Christian service of the year. Now they did it a couple times a year, but towards his, the end of his years, end of his time here on earth, they did it on the Sunday closest to New Year's. It was to, to prepare the, the Christian groups, the gatherings, for mission, time of mission in the coming year, where they would recommit themselves to the work of God. It was a time of self-reflection, <laughs> confession, promise-making, and just, just the desire become people of God. At this time, when we renew our covenant with God, we're to give ourselves wholly to Him. Like Deuteronomy says, with our entire body, our entire soul, everything we have, we're to give to God because He gave us everything. So we gather today to do that. To give ourselves a covenant, make a promise to Him that we won't break this year. During this service, all Christians are to repent of, of the things they've done this year. We know that, that none of us are perfect. As Jim said, sometimes when we see somebody, we make judgments. And it happens quickly, before we even think of it. But that's not what we're supposed to do. We're just supposed to bring people Jesus, not bring them judgment. The people during Wesley's time were serious about the covenants. They would start on, on New Year's Eve, and the service would last about three hours. Now, we're not going to go that long. <laughs> Just over an hour. But before we start the covenant service, we need to know what a covenant is and how many covenants God gave us. Now, a covenant is defined as a chosen relationship in which two parties make binding promises to each other. This is something we choose to do. It's not something we have to do something we want to do for our Lord and Savior who did so much for us. Marriage, that's a good example of a covenant, right? Nobody forces anybody to get married. Two people choose to get married. And what Jesus tells us in Matthew and Mark, he tells us that two will become one flesh. They are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. I mean, this picture can't be any more obvious. When we hear these words, we think of two people merging together, becoming one. And when you become one, you can't be separated. Only by surgery or divorce. And those are two very drastic things. So God intended marriage to be forever. Sometimes people 
come together with the, the wrong person and divorce happens. But it's God's will that we stay together forever. We need to understand that a covenant is not a business relationship. It's a personal relationship between two people that have a personal relationship together. That's why our, our covenant with God is so important. Because the first thing we have with Him is a personal relationship. That's all He's ever wanted. He created us because He loves us. He didn't need us. He could have just created the animals and crops and greenery and trees to grow by themselves. He certainly didn't need us, but He wanted us because He loved us. Covenant. Two parties that care about each other. As God cares about us. Now almost all the covenants that God gave us. Almost all the covenants God gave us are conditional. God will do something for us if we do what he asks. That's a condition. It almost sounds like a contract, but the big difference is God loves us. And even when we break our covenant with him, he gives us second chances and third chances and fourth chances. He wants us to get it right. Of course, if we don't do something good, something bad happens. Because we all know there's no free lunch. We have to try to keep God's covenant. We have to try to do what he asks. Otherwise, there's consequences. In summary, a covenant is a couple of things. It's personal, not a business agreement. Both parties know each other. As well as we know God, that's how he knows us. If we don't have, first have a personal relationship with God, we have no idea what that covenant means. We need to love him as much as he loves us. Both parties make promises to each other. God promises things to us. And we promise things to Him. And we try to keep them. Promises, when they're kept, good things happen. When promises are broken, bad things happen. Now the good news is, God always keeps His promises. And like I said, He loves to give us chances. Let's try to keep them. Now that first covenant... It's God's covenant with Adam. He said, you can have anything here in Eden. I created everything for you. All the fruit. The animals for company. I even gave you a wife. Just don't eat from the tree of knowledge. <coughs> what happens? He ate it. We hear in Genesis, the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make it healthy for him. So God gave Adam everything. He gave him everything he needed. He gave him fruit. He gave him a wife. He gave him the opportunity to live with God forever. And all he had to do was one thing. He couldn't do it. Adam broke his promise and God says, you're dead to me. Except what happened? As soon as God kicked him out of Eden, he clothed him, he protected him, he gave him children. So even though Adam and Eve didn't obey and didn't keep their part of the covenant, God was still gracious kept his part. The second covenant comes from Genesis chapter 9, God's covenant with Noah, that God will never destroy the earth by flood. Now this is the only truly unconditional covenant that God made with us. We don't have to do anything. God saw what happened with the flood and he said, never more. I'll never do it again. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. God put no conditions on that one. 
He's just never going to do it again because he loves us so much. The third covenant, it's God's covenant with Abram. If Abram is faithful to God and blameless, God will make Abram fruitful and kings will come from Abram's line. And this is an everlasting covenant. Now, some, some scholars say that this is an unconditional covenant. That God is going to do this no matter what. But we see right in Genesis 17, verses 1 and 2, here's what God said. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and blameless. Then I will make my covenant between you and me to increase your numbers. So right there, God put a condition on that covenant. And Abram was faithful. He was blameless. Sure, he told a couple lies about his wife, <laughs> that she was his sister. But he did that so he wouldn't be killed. So he didn't continue the line. And we know it's everlasting because Jesus came from the line of Abram. Fourth covenant from Exodus, the Ten Commandments. This is God's conditional covenant with Moses, the Israelites, and us. God says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possessions. So what God is saying to the Israelites and us is, I am your God and you are my people. That part's forever. But the conditional covenant must be kept in its entirety. We can't miss one of those commandments. Now, we studied the Ten Commandments for two weeks earlier in the year, and we all found out how impossible it is to keep those things. Why would God give us something that he knew we couldn't keep? He's got a perfectly good reason. The Mosaic Covenant is important because it showed everybody the impossibility of keeping God's commands. We can't do it. We cannot keep even one of those things. So if we can't keep God's commands and we can't save ourselves, we need Jesus. No doubt. The Ten Commandments were given to us to tell us we can't do it. There's only one person that's pure, sinless, and becomes the final sacrifice for us. Plain and simple, folks, we need Jesus. And that's what the people outside need to know. They need to know that they need Jesus also. Because no matter how good they are, no matter how good they try to live, it's not going to be good enough. And there's no purgatory out there that we can pray people out of. Belief in Jesus and repentance is the only way. Jesus told us so. Then we come to the sixth and final covenant. Let us get one. So the fifth covenant, the Davidic covenant, that's where the Father declares that the eternal king would come from the line of David. No conditions on this covenant either. But only the only son of David that would come and be an eternal king would be Jesus. Not Solomon, not any of the rest of them. Now we get to the last covenant. The sixth covenant. Jesus tells us in Luke 22, that he is the new covenant. And only Jesus can satisfy all the requirements of the Ten Commandments. He was the only one that was ever born sinless, ever lived sinless, ever died sinless. Jesus is the final sacrifice. Why did this happen? God tells us in John 3.16, and if we had our Awana kids here, I would trot them out because they know this one by heart. Do you guys know John 3.16? Yes. Let's hear it. For God so loved his that he sent only son. Amen. Amen. For God so loved the entire world that he gave up his one and only son for all his adopted children. all his adopted children. The only requirement that we have to do to keep this covenant is to believe in Jesus. That's it. How simple can it be? 
Now, why would John Wesley think that he'd have to add anything to this last covenant? Why would he think it'd be, it'd be necessary to, to add something on top of what Jesus said, that he is the final covenant? Because a covenant is a chosen relationship in which two parties make binding promises to each other. Two parties, us and God. And we choose to make this covenant. We don't have to. We don't have to believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Unless, of course, we don't want to be saved. And since he's already done all the work, all the hard work, all the heavy lifting, I think we owe it to him to make a return promise that we would try to become like him. The only thing that God wants and expects from us is our love and our devotion and our obedience. And that's why we gather here today. Let us clear our minds and our hearts of all thoughts. Anything that we have now that we're holding on to, that we hold against anybody, that we hold against anyone, any fear, any anger, anything. Let's forget all about that. Almighty God, you search our hearts and all our desires. You know everything about us. From you, no secrets are hidden. Through your Holy Spirit, cleanse our hearts so we may perfectly love you and glorify your holy name. We pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now as God's dearly loved children, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Dearly beloved sisters and brothers, the Christian life is a life found in Christ, where we are redeemed from sin by his holy blood, where we are consecrated to God. We are those who have entered into this Christian life, and we've been admitted to this new covenant through Jesus Christ. And Jesus sealed this covenant with his own blood so that it would last forever. On one side of the covenant stands God, who promises to give us new and eternal life. Jesus is the author and the perfecter of this faith, of our eternal life. Every day God proves his goodness to us and his grace to us and keeps his promise to us. On the other side, we stand as those who promise to no longer live life for ourselves, but in, instead to live only for Jesus Christ, because he loved us all. And he gives us his life forever. There's times in our lives when it's important to remember this covenant. When it's time and important for us to renew this covenant. This is that day. Many generations have done this before us. And today we make this covenant our own. Renewing the both joy and sincerity. The covenant that binds us all to God. Father, we are those who are gathered here to seek to live as true disciples of you. But sometimes we fall short. Let us now examine ourselves before God, humbly confessing our sins and submitting our hearts to the Lord so that we do not deceive ourselves and cut ourselves away from God. Let us pray. Father, Father God, God, you have, you have sent, sent forth, forth the way of life, of life through your, your Son, Son, Jesus Christ, Christ whom you love dearly. We shamefully confess that we have been slowly to learn and have been good to follow him. You have spoken and called us. You have revealed to us the beauty. You have stretched out your hands to us, for our friends. May we pass on. And offered little thanks. We are unworthy. We now confess to you, Lord, our sins. Please forgive us. Copy of our and the selfishness of our fears and our inconsistencies in unbelief. We 
for our presentation to tell others about Christ. The ways we see others. Click. Forgive us, Lord, for we have wasted time and we misconstrued gifts given us. Forgive us for what we have excuses for the wrong things that we have done and when we have purposely avoided the responsibilities you have given us. Forgive us for we have been unwilling to overcome evil with good that we have not been ready to carry our cross. Forgive us that we are not allowed Forgive us for the times when instead of working for unity, we make it hard for others to live with us because of our lack of forgiveness, inconsiderate judgment, quick, quick criticism. Forgive us for we are not trying to reconcile with others that we are slow to seek redemption. Forgive us now, Lord, for these sins that we sadly confess to you now. Let's all take a few minutes to ask God to forgive us the sins we have admitted, the things we've done in this past year that we'd like not to have to repeat this year. This week I urge you to go to those that you may have injured this year, that you may have sinned against and ask for their forgiveness. If there's someone that you can help, this week I ask you to go and help them. Let us gather here before the Lord, now in covenant, commit ourselves to Christ as servants. Let us give ourselves to him so that we may fully belong to him. Jesus Christ has left us with many services to be done. Some of these services are easy and honorable, but some are difficult and disgraceful. Some of these things Jesus has left for us line up with our desires and our interests. Others are contrary to both. In some we please both Christ and ourselves, but then there are other works where, where we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. Jesus Christ, we offer you this prayer. Lord God, please let me be your servant. Let me follow your commands. I will no longer follow my own desires. I will give myself completely.